So, <clears throat> hello everyone, and welcome to another session of Evenings with Jesus. We're happy to see everybody here tonight. And tonight, we're going to be discussing the sixth and seventh petitions of the Lord's Prayer from our book, The Reservoir. And the study will be on page 67. So uh, before we uh, begin our discussion, let's open with prayer. Father, we know that you want us to resist temptation. We know you have not allowed any temptation to happen to us, which is beyond our strength to resist. In you, we have the freedom to choose not to sin. And you have given us your spirit to stand firm against temptation. When we are tempted to sin, help us instead to focus on your goodness to us, so that, that is to demonstrate it by the cross. Fill us with your spirit and make us hate sin as much as you do. We also pray, deliver us from evil. Our world is in turmoil and trouble. Deliver us from hate. Deliver us from violence. Deliver us from sickness, and in our polarized society, raise up people of reason, wisdom, and goodwill. You have bought our lives with the precious blood of your son, Jesus, and it's in whose, his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay, well, tonight, as I said, we're going to be looking at the sixth and seventh uh, petitions. I'm going to start with the sixth petition, and there are actually two versions of this petition in use today. There's the traditional version, which is in our devotional book, and lead us not into temptation. And there's the contemporary version, save us from the time of trial. And in my research this week, I uh, found a fact uh, that that second petition, save us from the time of trial, was uh, first written by an ecumenical and scholarly group called the International Consultation on English Text in the early 1970s. Now, I might want to fact check that with Pastor Craig and Pastor Charles, because, uh, you know, you can't believe everything you see on uh, the Internet. Isn't that a surprise? But anyway, that's what it said. So... Uh, I thought that uh, we would start out by first uh, taking a look at what the major difference between these two versions of the sixth petition are. And I think in order to do that, we first would have to define uh, what is temptation and what is trial. So I would ask anyone, what, what do you think that temptation is? Boy, if you don't know what it is, you're, we're all in really big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to really need to pray. Anyone? Pastor Craig. I'll, I'll start out by saying uh, we talked about the Lord's Prayer at the, uh, the lunch bunch uh, on Monday. And um, <laughs> I, uh, I brought up the fact that um, if you know you're being tempted, uh, it's no longer temptation. Um, you know, if I know I'm being tempted and I continue to do it, that just makes it a bad choice, right? If I know that, oh, I should not be doing this, but I continue to do it anyway, um, that then I, I'm just making a bad choice. But uh, temptation means that something is happening to us that ultimately will have a, a bad effect upon us, and we don't even recognize that it's coming. Uh, that's that's one of the things that I think about when uh, we talk about, um, you know, temptation. We don't even know um, you know, we're maybe traveling down a road that we think is perfectly fine and there's nothing wrong, but little do we know if we continue down that road, ultimately we're going to either get hurt or uh, be down in a way that we shouldn't be doing. Um, so that's, I think, the, the key for me with temptation is we don't even realize that it's happening to us at the time uh, and there's something bad down the pike that we're not even aware of yet. So, oh. Yes, Carol. I might argue just a little bit with you because if you 
are an alcoholic and you get invited to a party where you know there is going to be alcohol and you will be tempted, that's a choice on your part. So I think in some circumstances, you do have a choice um, that you know that it's going to be there. Um, I know that the way you were saying it, of course, that that's the other meaning, but I think that sometimes we, we don't set ourselves up for, for being tempted. Mm-hmm. Yes, Charles. Doesn't uh, temptation kind of have the connotation of something that entices us, kind of lures us in? Exactly. Yeah, it is an attempt to get someone to sin against God. So with that, who, who then uh, or what would be tempting us? Satan. Well, one of the big ones is the devil tempts us. Our, our ego tempts us. Our ego? Yeah. Um, you know, I hear... Um, I hear stories of pastors um, getting um, uh, very good package deals from uh, other congregations to lure them away. Um, you know, kind of the things about like, you know, we'll double your salary kind of thing. Um, there's no sense of call whatsoever to that specific congregation. But the temptation is, is, man, you know, I could, I could pastor that community and make double what I'm making now. Why wouldn't I do that? So um, I think sometimes our ego gets in the way um, that that tempts us as well. And it does. Yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts? How about the world? How does the world tempt us? We all have televisions. <laughs> yes. All we have to do is turn commercials. It on yes. And look at one of these disgusting commercials that they now are running on the major networks. Uh, that's a, that's a temptation. How about our own flesh? That's a big one. So, you know, that would, that would cover, uh, you know, Charles definition of that enticement or the attempt to get someone to sin against God. Those are our three ways for temptation. So lead us not into temptation. And then how about save us from the time of trial? What's a trial? Is it the same as temptation? Or is it different? Yes, Charles. For me, me it has the uh, connotation of a hardship. It's something that's difficult. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, Linda, you had your hand up. It's basically the same thing. I think, I think they're totally different temptation and trial. If you're trying to be saved from trial, you're trying to save yourself from any, um, any problems or any, uh, judgment. Whereas if you're asking about temptation, to me, that's more biblical. Okay. Uh, another another word for trial is also test. So, what would you? How would you define test? I think. Well, Charles, I think you already said it. You know, it's going through uh, some hardship, uh, <coughs> that type of thing. Uh, and there's some classic biblical examples of uh, trials and tests uh, in the Bible. Anybody think they can name a couple of them? Yes, Marcia. The first one that comes to mind is Job and his tests one. and trials. Okay. Yes, Lois. Yeah. Uh, trials, it could be anything from poor health. I mean, seriously, poor health, uh, financial. 
uh, I think we could really make a list when it comes to trials and different kinds. You're right. There's a lot of different types of trials. Another big one in the Bible is Israel in the wilderness. Yeah. That was a big trial. 40 years worth. <laughs> and how about Abraham when God told him to sacrifice Isaac? So in that those cases, uh, you know, scripture tells us that God does test people. So, uh, you know, the test then would be uh, that someone is put through this some kind of a, a hardship or a trial in order to see uh, how they handle it, how they come out on the other side. So, if God puts us to the test, what do you think his purpose is in testing people? Why does he do it? You just want to be mean? I don't know yet. Hello? Am I can anybody hear me? <laughs> yeah, I I uh, Jim, I think of um, you know, Paul's um understanding about um you know uh the whole thing about I can't think of the the book that it's in, but the endurance. You know, when we endure things, it, it brings about patience, and then the patience, um, it goes through all of this, and trials lead to um, kind of um, a reliance upon God's, uh, God's strength and God's will. So all of the bad, Paul says, ultimately, all the bad things um, that happen to us ultimately strengthen our faith in God. That's his ultimate uh, logic, and I think that's true, because um, especially when the trials are very great, um, we end up realizing that there's no way uh, that we're ever going to overcome this, you know, on our own. And so we ultimately have to uh, trust solely in God's strength, trust uh, solely in God's wisdom. Um, it's an act of surrender. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons that um, when the tests come, that ultimately it helps us um, trust that God is enough and that God will get us through, not usually the way we had hoped, uh, that God would pull us through, but ultimately God, uh, God does. Thank you. Uh, yes, Lorraine. Well, well, I agree with Paul. Also, I think it teaches us to be humble. Okay. So he's uh, when he's testing us, he's. He's obviously uh, never does it uh, to mean harm, bring harm to us, uh, and it's never to, to drive us away from him, but it's really always to drive us closer to him, and like Pastor said, you know, to depend on him uh, and on him alone. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think like in, in uh, 2 Timothy uh, 3.16, where it says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servants of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So when he's teaching and helping us, he's testing us, uh, and we're learning uh, from him. So if God tests us, does he also tempt us? That should be a resounding no. <laughs> uh, Jim? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. We, uh, I think it was Monday when we were talking about this, or was it in Pastor's sermon? Uh, anyhow, the, we mentioned the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus and the Earth is to Have We Trials and Temptations? Uh, is there trouble anywhere? And it ends with take it to the Lord in prayer. That really is, to me, has always been a real important three lines or four. Uh, because in the end, that's what we have to do. It, we can't trust ourselves. We have, that's the communication that we have through prayer. It's a great point. That's the ultimate choice is take it to pray. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, you know, like in the 
James 1, 13 through 15, it says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed, as Charles said. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So, you know, this, uh, this petition in, in Save Us from the Time of Trial, uh, it's often misread and misunderstood as Jesus is teaching us to pray that God will not allow or permit us to be tempted. But we know that that's not true. First uh, Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out. That's if we choose to take it so that you can endure it. So when we pray, lead us not into temptation or save us from the time of trial, I think we also have to be careful of how and what we're praying or in that regard, so we don't mean the wrong thing. And some of the ways would be, we don't want to ask God not to test us, because we know God does test us. And uh, we know that he also tests us for our own good. Uh, we don't want to ask him not to allow us to face hardship or spare us from any of our earthly troubles or to keep the devil or the world or our flesh from tempting us at all because he does allow that to happen and that's when he wants us to come to him as you said Lois in prayer and as Paul did say we must go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God Jesus himself said in the world you will have tribulations and Peter said about the devil, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. So the sixth petition then, two different versions, I think two different meanings uh, as well, temptation and trial. Anybody else have any other comments on the sixth petition? Okay. No, no, Charles has his oh, hand up. Yes, Charles. Yes. You first, Charles. I was just going to say, uh, Can you hear? we have to remember that uh, like very often is Satan in the world who tempts us. You know, God may allow it to happen, but God's not the one holding the carrot on the stick in front of us. That's true. And we also have to remember that God is in control of Satan. He's allowing him to do that, as he did with Job. That's kind of a similar type of a thing. So that's why he's got control, and that's why it says he won't let us be tempted any more than we can endure. Although sometimes we probably think, I can't endure one more second of this. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think a lot of times um, we think of this petition, the lead us not into temptation as a, as a bad thing, um, as something that uh, we don't want to have to deal with. Um, but notice where the, the, the always, Luther always talked about how we need to be mindful of language. And the first two words are lead us, right? Um, lead us not. Um, and so to me, this is a recognition that, um, that God is fully in control, that God is looking out for us. You know, I always envision going up a steep mountain where you can't see what's coming around the bend, uh, but God knows what's around the bend. And so maybe um, there's that little voice inside of you that sometimes says, you know, something's not right up ahead. So, you know, slow down kind of thing. Um, that's the way I read those. Lead us not in temptation that, you know, simply trust that God is knowing um, what's going on in our lives, that, that God is looking out for us, and we just entrust 
um, our lives into God's hands, that God will lead us through the either the trials or the temptations that we will face. Um, so I, I think this is a very, um, instead of something that we should kind of um, worry about, I think it's something that we should celebrate that God is in fact leading us through the, the times and the trials of our lives. Yes, Carol. Well, kind of thinking of what everybody has said, we live in a sinful world where the devil is around and um, there are temptations here. And like Pastor said, we have to ask God to help our ego not take over, but to help lead us the right way to resist those temptations. And we can't do it alone, but it's something we have to keep reinforcing over and over and over again in our lives that and trust that he will be with us. Yeah, I'm always... Uh, grateful that uh that uh the devil is a, was created so he's a he's a he's a creation so that's why god's got him in control and you know god's got him on the short leash now so uh and of course he knows it so that's why he works so hard at uh at uh, tempting us <laughs> okay so moving on to the seventh petition but deliver us from evil what does this petition mean to you? No one? Well, you know, God knows our exposure to temptation and that uh, and he knows that temptation can either uh, build our spiritual muscle, if you want to say, or it can destroy us. And, you know, it's, it's our choice. Yeah. Yes, Marsha. Well, I, I tend to think that the temptation that we are praying to avoid always ends in evil. So I think that that is, to me, one and the same thing. Temptation and evil there is no temptation that's going to be good that I'm asking God to keep me away from. It's all going to be evil. Even ice cream? Well, <laughs> not necessarily that, but um, sometimes it can be evil. Sometimes it can be bad if you're a diabetic or, um, you know, you've, you've had enough calories for the day. Um, you have to be mindful of that as well. That's a good point. Yes, Laureen. Well, I agree with what Marsh is saying because I was thinking about David when he was tempted by Bathsheba. And then look at all the evil that became of that act. Acts. So I think they're together. Point. Yes, Marsha. And I thought about that too. But I thought of it this way. Um, do we know that Bathsheba went out on that wherever she went to tempt David? Or was that all on David? Yeah, yeah. Bath Bathsheba uh, in houses back then, there was one place to to wash uh, and she was she was just you know you might we call it a bathtub but um you know she was just washing where the you know like the communal bath was and um david being in the palace you know had a bird's eye view of the entire kingdom so he could just look out and normally these bath bathing areas were on the roof type area mm -hmm. uh so yeah it's just um <clears throat> i i don't i don't think uh you know, in that story, uh, um, David has all of the power. Uh, so right. I, have a, I have a very hard time blaming any of that on Bathsheba. Uh, you know, when uh, David sees her beauty, uh, he summons her. And, you know, it's not like Bathsheba could have said, oh, I don't, I don't think I want to go. You know, I mean, when the king summons you, especially when you were female back then, you didn't, you didn't have a choice. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I have a hard time blaming any of this that story on Bathsheba because she was definitely not the one in power 
On the other hand, um, and having seen the play Samson in the Sight and Sound Theater in Branson, Delilah went out of her way to tempt Samson. Mm -hmm. There was no question there. Mm -hmm. In the play. In the play. In the play. <laughs> but isn't that, I mean, isn't that based on it's Hollywood. Biblical, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was brought to life in the play. Yes. But the same is true in the, the story. Bible, you have yes. to just kind of envision what the story would be. But when it's brought to life, um, it was very obvious what she was doing. Yes. I'm careful about how Hollywood perceives biblical. <laughs> well, this is not Hollywood. This is this is the Sight and Sound Theater in Branson, which I don't equate with Hollywood. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Esther, the, Charles. Well, if you remember the story, uh, you know she's trying to figure out what's giving him his strength, right? Right. Um, and he knows that she's being uh, um, tricky. And so he continues to tell her lies, right? Oh, it's in this and that. And she tries to, um, you know, overcome him with that. And then he, you know, he finally tells her the truth. Um, so, um, yeah, she's definitely, uh, she's definitely a, a tempter. She's definitely a kind of a trickster kind of character yes. within the biblical story as well. As opposed to Bathsheba, whom I think is kind of innocent. Yeah. Any other thoughts about the seventh petition? One, one thing, um, you know, and deliver us from evil. Um, I think when I was, um, I don't know why, but when I was young in my faith, I always uh, equated this to the uh, the last day, you know, deliver us from the evil one, you know, the literally the, mm -hmm. the, um, the exact uh, translation of this is deliver us from the evil one you know it's the it's the devil that that he's uh, and so i always thought of that as the last day you know when i stand before god um but luther helps us understand that you know as he says you know it's all kind of evil the body soul property reputation and then he gets in at the last when our final hour comes you know grant us a blessed end in other words entrust our lives to your grace because we will never be um, good enough or smart enough to uh, to earn our way into heaven but um, you know there's a sense that evil is you know lurking all around us um, and sometimes just things that happen to us um, that are just you know because we're part of a broken world they end up um, you know sabotaging our thoughts make us very down make us question the goodness of anything in this world kind of thing um, and so I think that's how this kind of plays out for us and deliver us from evil. Don't let all of the bad stuff of this world uh, overtake our thoughts. Um, you know, help us to see that there's good in the world as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, I think uh, going back to what you said, Lois, about prayer, uh, you know, I, I think that our prayer should be that we submit ourselves to God's will and that we, we surrender control to him. We ask him to keep us protected or deliver us from evil and give us the strength that we need when we're confronted with temptation or a trial or a hardship, be it sickness, financial, like you said, a lot of different trials uh, when they uh, confront us in our lives. Any final thoughts on those two petitions? Well, perhaps, you know, the value of having two different versions of the Lord's Prayer, the <laughs> traditional version and the contemporary version, is that uh, uh, the Lord's Prayer is the humility of the cross uh, that those two different versions point us to. So let's continue then with our scripture reading tonight. And I believe, Marcia, you were going to do that for us. I have it right here. Go for it. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. One through seven. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it opens up, you know, with at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So I think uh, it's important that we kind of understand the context in which this question was asked. And it comes right after Jesus has already told his disciples, not once, but twice, that about uh, the suffering and the death that awaits him in Jerusalem. And after he's told them that uh, following him involves denying themselves and taking up the cross. So it kind of seems to me that Jesus's message has not uh, really penetrated the minds and the hearts of uh, the disciples. You know, perhaps they, they heard the part about the kingdom of heaven drawing near, <clears throat> but they have obviously not understood what kind of a kingdom that is, or, you know, they're kind of preoccupied with their own question about what their <clears throat> status is going to be. Uh, in the kingdom yeah there it is and, you know the the temptation of the ego there it is right there yep. um you know there yeah. look there's 12 of us and we've been following jesus um surely there's a pecking order by now jesus so you know which one which one is your favorite um you know they they ask this in all the gospels by the way um this is yeah, this is definitely the, the, this yes. the first time they've done that <laughs> yes yes Hey, wasn't it James and John that were fighting about which side they were going to sit on? And then their mom got involved. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah and they, the interesting thing about this um, is that, you know, they're wanting to know who's the greatest. And ultimately, Jesus says the greatest is what? You know, the, the servant, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, they're wanting the, the best seats, you know, in other texts, they're wanting the, the best seats in the house. And Jesus says, if you want to be the greatest, you have to be the um, the greatest servant among us. So um, Jesus, you know, I'm not sure you want this, uh, this title kind of thing. So I think Carol had her okay. hand up. No, I was just going to say my uh, Bible version in verse seven, it says instead of offenses that Marcia read, it says temptation, uses the word temptation, which mm -hmm. I thought was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. And of course, we all know that Jesus was fully human and that he felt every emotion that we do, including frustration, but that he never sinned. However, you know, I can't help but wonder uh, that in his frustration with his disciples, if he ever had the thought, oh, Father, these guys are just dumber than a bag of rocks. Now, I know he didn't think that, but that just crossed my mind once or twice. I mean, these guys were either totally clueless or they were just so filled with their own selves uh, that they had a selective hearing, I guess. Uh, so in uh, response uh, to their question, Jesus calls a little child to him, tells the disciples that unless they change, and become as little children, they will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So what do you think that he means by that statement? Yes, Carol. Children are cool. They, they trust. Um, they believe the best in everyone. And most of them will follow a trusted person. So they're good examples. Innocence. Mm -hmm. Marcia, did you have your hand up? I was going to say, similarly to what Carol said, 
they're just so innocent and so trusting and little sponges just ready to soak up pretty much whatever you whatever you tell them or whatever they you know are given to learn but um they're just so innocent mm -hmm. and uh what about uh that if they don't become like little children they will never enter the kingdom of heaven we talked about their trust their innocence what what else when they ask the question, you know, who is the greatest? And we talked about the ego. They're more concerned with their own status and their own egos that, you know, they kind of missed the point totally. And Jesus is kind of telling them, you know, if you guys don't wise up, you're going to miss the boat. The, the ship is going to have sailed and you're not going to be on it. So, uh, and he explains what he means by becoming like little children. And he answers that question with whoever humbles themselves like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So a couple of uh, you have already answered what that kind of childlike humility looks like, trust, innocence. What are some of the other things? Uh, Yes, Laurie. Well, Pastor Craig uses a lot. He he says we're children of God a lot, or a child of God, and a child is dependent on their parents. And I think that's what God meant for us to be dependent on Him to um, to be helpless without Him. That we should just we should depend on Him. It's like a child depends on their parents. Yep. Yes. Linda? Well, Carol had her hand up first. Oh, no. I was just going to say the ironic thing is that children are very self-centered. You know, the whole world revolves around them. But they still have faith in those um, that they trust. And, you know, we all have an ego, and that's not always a bad thing. It just means you're maybe secure in your faith, just like those children are in, our, in the grown-ups or whomever they trust. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, Linda. Um, Go ahead. I put down, they openly ask for help. A lot of adults don't ask for help of God or anybody else, but little children will ask for help. Will you help me tie my shoe or whatever? I mean, they just, they're not concerned about how it looks. They just want help. And I think we need to talk to God that way. They're also very honest. Most of the time. <laughs> Tell the hands in the cookie jar. <laughs> And I don't know about innocence. I remember when I was a little kid, we'd go, my mom would take us to the store and, you know, we'd be tagging along. And she purposely avoided the candy aisle because she knew what was going to happen if she went there. We would not be innocent, believe me. Any other uh, uh, things that uh, you can think of uh, that childlike humility uh, might be? Okay, so then he talks about uh, causing to stumble uh, in uh, this verse six, where he says, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. So in that context, who is he talking about as the little one? Who is he referring to? Is he referring to that little child or the children? Or is he saying something else? Yes, Pastor. Um, the, uh, the one thing, you know, 
the the conversation so far when we were talking about uh, temptation and trial it was always something that was done to us or something that we're dealing with uh and as we continue on with this text you know he ultimately says but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting um i think sometimes we have to step back and say how do we uh tempt others maybe to um do things that maybe that is not um of god um and i think um, we could probably talk about that how, what that would look like but you know sometimes i think we are the tempter uh you know sometimes very innocently we don't realize what we're doing but um you know but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting that means that we're not only tempted but sometimes we tempt others without um, recognize what we're doing or sometimes maybe we do um, know what we are doing so um mm -hmm. yes lois yeah i don't know if uh, i'm getting ahead of things but when you look at this paper that pastor gave us um with at luther's comments it says it is true god tempts no one but we ask in this prayer but we ask in this prayer that god would preserve and keep us so that the devil and the world and our flesh may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief so when he says oh belief despair and other great and same shameful sins so it sounds to me like belief how you believe um uh, in god's word or i don't really know if that's what he meant but belief in him is important and we we haven't even said anything about that so um i want to know what everybody feels about that belief despair belief false belief because there sure is a lot of that around <laughs> i think we all have um come across that Mm -hmm. Well, and also, you know, what is what is uh, what does Jesus mean by stumbling? Uh, just tripping over yourself, or you know, falling down? Or, you know, what does it mean if anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble? Yeah, I'd like to know. Yeah, Carol. Well, my Version says fall into sin. Okay. That's what mine says too, is to sin. So, so that's exactly right. It's it's really sinning or falling away from God. Uh, you know, doubting. So the little children that Jesus is referring to is then I think uh those who are like little children in the way that that they trust God uh, and that they live a you know a simple life of peace of assurance you know they're they're just very trusting of God and they they tend to trust others so they can be uh, easily manipulated if you want to say uh, or drawn away from God attempted by others so uh what would be some of the ways i, I already mentioned manipulation and pastor you did also in a way by uh, a person uh, that's in a position of authority or power uh, and we certainly have seen countless uh, abuses of this uh, type of Thing within the church at large over the last many, many years. Uh, any others that you can think of that would be uh, a way uh, you could, of stumbling? What causes one of a person that's really trusting God uh, to uh, stumble or fall away? One of the uh, one of the things that I'm always leery about is when um, pastors um, say that unless oh, you I would call um, him. at least um, if you don't believe exactly like I believe, then uh, you're totally wrong because I know the Bible better than you do kind of thing. 
um, where the the pastor has all of the answers and has you know everything figured out. Um, this is why I I so appreciate the whole Lutheran faith because the Lutheran faith is not black and white. Um, sometimes it drives me crazy because it is not, but um, you know uh, the Lutheran faith has a lot of gray area in it. Uh, in other words, there's no absolutes a lot of times. We do have absolutes, but other times there's no um, absolute. So what we do is we have faith conversations like this. Um, so, you know, someone may say something in the middle of a Bible study that I totally disagree with, um, but that does not mean that they're wrong. Uh, that means a lot of times that they've had a different life experience that I have had. They've had, um, um, you know, different encounters with God that I have never experienced before. Uh, and so through sharing those conversations, I think we can uh, have a better understanding how God is at work among all of us. Um, so, uh, you know, the, uh, there are churches that where you go and the pastor will tell you, you know, this is what you must believe. And if you don't, um, you know, sometimes you get kicked out. Other times you get reprimanded kind of thing. Um, but that's not what the Lutheran faith is. The Lutheran faith is having, you know, faith conversations where we come to understand how God is active and alive and well in each of our lives. And we can learn things about God just by hearing each other's um, stories. Um, uh, Jim? Yes. I, I think of what Pastor just said. It reminds me of uh, when Paul was on his missionary journeys. That was one of the things that... Uh, to me, that was one of the main things that he did was to have those conversations in those communities. And, and isn't it right that, that they weren't doing that and some of them had slipped off in the wrong direction on his faith journeys? Yes. That's true. Yeah. Yes, Carol. I think of, uh, my whole life is just a faith journey. Um, it's kind of, you know, as a child, I, I believed everything I was taught as a grown up. I questioned because that's how I learn and my life has changed. I've got more wisdom. I have more experiences. Um, it's kind of like going on a diet and you fall one day, but you get forgiven and you go back the next day. So I think, you know, that's just how my faith is sometimes it's a big roller coaster sometimes it's real steady and sometimes it's it's not at all so um it's as long as I keep my eye on the goal then I feel like it's okay that's just part of my journey mm -hmm. and you know for me uh I think that you know when someone has that childlike faith and that really trust God greatly that, uh, and I'm speaking for myself, I was, I was always, I'm inclined uh, to place a great deal of trust in my church leaders and in my pastors. And unfortunately, through my life, I've been terribly hurt and disappointed by some of them. And they were all Lutheran pastors as well. So, uh, you know, and that's, that's very hurtful. And I think that's uh, another way that uh, uh, we can be caused to stumble. Cause, and I know, you know, we always say, well, you know, you can't place pastors on a pedestal, but unfortunately we do. Mm. And I think we hold pastors to a higher standard uh, when one of them does do what is human and they sin, uh, it's more it's more hurtful to us and it causes us a, a great deal of pain. Yeah, that's scary. Well, I I you know being a child of a pastor, they're human too, and I know that pastors also have faith journeys. Um, they're more learned than we are, and they're on a pedestal because God called them. You know, we didn't receive the same kind of call, but they also make mistakes. And so we have to take that into consideration in our faith journey, too, that we have to be forgiving whenever a pastor's in a maybe a low point in their roller coaster of their life and make a mistake. Um, Good point. Yeah. 
and uh, not all pastors are the same, but um, I, um, you know, when someone um, either after church or the next week uh, come to me and they, they challenge something that I said in the sermon, um, I, I, I think that is fantastic. Um, one, they were listening, you know, that's the first thing. And two, they have started thinking about it and they're wrestling with, I mean, if they're challenging something that I've said, they're wrestling with something, right? Um, whether I'm right or wrong, they're wrestling with something and it allows us to have a pretty in-depth uh, faith conversation. So, you know, I love those moments when people say, you know, I, I just either, I don't know what you meant by that, or I totally disagree with you on this. And this is why um, I, I find that very um rejuvenating i think because it it allows um two people of faith to have a conversation and sometimes um ultimately we're not going to agree but you know it it leads to a very deep um deep faith conversations where um and sometimes it's simply you know no that's not what i said this is what i said and they're like oh okay well you know then then i have these questions kind of thing but um but yeah, so, you know, the, the role of pastor, Charles can talk about this too, has radically changed uh, in the um, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, pastors, um, they were very, very high esteem. You know, they were up there with uh, doctors and lawyers and, you know, police officers. That's the kind of uh, respect that they received. Um, pastors today, um, where they're um, especially the unchurched, uh, they just don't know they don't believe that they can trust pastors because we're up to no good simply because there have been some terrible role models um, um, of pastors uh, within, especially very um, uh, churches that have been very, um, uh, you know, in the news a lot, uh, fallen from grace kind of thing, doing some terrible, terrible things. And so, um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of people today that just uh, believe that pastors simply cannot be trusted. Uh, that I will uh, discover truth in my own way, that I don't need a pastor to tell me what truth is. Um, and I, I always tell people, I don't, I hope that that is not the only thing that a pastor will, will help you do is discover what truth is. Uh, but, you know, pastor is someone who can journey with you, um, you know, through the difficult times that can um, lead you through some conversations that perhaps other people simply could not do. So, um, but yeah, the, the role of pastor has uh, radically changed uh, that we no longer have the what you would call the respect and the clout that uh, we did. Even you know when I started uh, pastoring 25 years ago, it was totally different than it is now. So maybe Charles could talk to that as well. He's got oh, he's there. He goes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true, and I think a lot has been from a lot of well, even within the Lutheran Church, there have been pastors have done things that that they shouldn't do mm. but i think a lot of it comes from outside organized denominations but it it scatters over to everyone and everyone is hurt by that mm -hmm. and there are pastors who unfortunately want more glory for themselves you know, even within the lutheran church you know, I, but we, we are no longer in the hair pastor generation where what the pastor says goes for everybody mm -hmm. and that's good sure yeah well then in our reading tonight uh christ he's moving into this uh these very kind of harsh examples and the strong language uh to convey the seriousness of the matter that he's trying to get across to his disciples. And, you know, he states very plainly that those in power who have caused the downfall of others are going to be held accountable. But I think he also is saying that for those who would be leaders in the church, the warning is even clearer that when he says uh, the extreme vigilance is necessary to guard against the possibility of leading those who trust in God and trust in them, uh, leading those astray. So any other comments on our scripture reading tonight? Well, I appreciate all the input uh, that we've had. And 
Charles, will you close us with the Lord's Prayer? Sure. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. <laughs> For the kingdom, power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. It was a great discussion, and we hope that you'll join us next Wednesday, same time, same station. And Pastor <laughs> Charles is going to be leading the discussion with the uh, conclusion of the Lord's Prayer, which is sometimes known as the doxology. And it, I'm sure, will prove itself to be very interesting. So come on back and join us. Everybody yes. have a blessed week. Thanks again. Yes. Thank you, Thank Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Oh. God bless everyone.